Hello everyone, my name is Kayla Myers and I'm a programmer here at Indie Memphis and welcome to our final Indie Talks for the festival. Um, the festival is presented by Duncan Williams Inc. and the Indie Talks are graciously supported by the Hohenberg Foundation. So thank you so much for their support. Um, I have the honor of introducing our really amazing group of panelists for this Indie Talk on gentrification in, in by film. First, we have Anthony Benua Simon, who is the director of Cane Fire. Anthony is a documentary filmmaker and editor. His films have screened at venues such as the Brooklyn Museum and MoMA PS1, as well as the websites Movie, Filmmaker Magazine, and Hyperallergic. In 2014, his short about the workers at the Domino Sugar Factory in Brooklyn, New York, Third Shift, won Best Documentary at the Brooklyn Film Festival. Anthony attended the Evergreen State College and was a fellow at the Union Docs Collaborative Studio Program. He's currently a member of the volunteer-run Spectacle Theater in Brooklyn, New York. And second, we have Zaire Love, who's the director of The Black Men I Know. Zaire is a filmmaker and music maker whose work honors and amplifies the voices of the Black South. She's a native of Memphis, Tennessee and a graduate of Spelman College, Houston Baptist University, and the University of Mississippi. The South has always had cornbread to share and Zaire is just adding creative packaging and shipping it worldwide through her films and music. And finally, we have Ephraim Masili, the director of The Inheritance. Ephraim is a filmmaker, DJ, and radio host whose focus is the African diaspora as a cultural force. His films have screened in festivals and venues all over the world, including the New York Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival, the Ann Arbor Film Festival, where he received the Most Promising Filmmaker Prize, the Milano Film Festival, the Trinidad and Tobago International Film Festival, the Boston Museum of Fine Art, the Maisels Institute in New York, and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco. He has served as instructor and technical director at Bard and the Scribe Video Center in Philadelphia. So welcome to all of our wonderful panelists, and we're gonna actually show you the trailers of Cane Fire and the, and the Inheritance really quickly before we start the conversation. Pack your things, you're coming over to Kauai. Kauai? How far is it to Honolulu or Waikiki? About 100 miles southeast, another island. We always end up 100 miles from the main attraction. When you hire the actors, you hire a lot of local people. They're not the lead actors. The walking background kind, you know. The place has a complicated history, and there are a lot of stories that haven't been told. Our existence threatens their existence. <laughs> When I was seven years old, my dad told me before he died, Diamond Dodge, they hide you and they can fly you. They used us. Wow, you're both just such 
great, exciting trailers. Um, I want to remind everyone watching before I start asking questions that you can ask questions in the chat on YouTube and Inventive and on Facebook. So if you have questions for later on, we open it up to audience Q&A. Please feel free to ask those now and they'll be forwarded to me. Um, so I think I wanted to start the conversation first by sort of placing each of y'all's works within the context of this topic conversation. Um, and I think starting with you, Ephraim, I think gentrification appears in its most subtle form in that conversation the two friends are having about the date that she went on, um, where she says something along the lines of like, she kept calling herself poor the whole night and she lives by herself. And so I'm just curious to hear you sort of discuss that particular moment and the writing of it, and then sort of how it fits into what you're trying to do with the inheritance as a whole. Absolutely. Uh, great, great scene to pinpoint in terms of setting up the conversation. You know, it was interesting when I was asked to be on this panel um, about gentrification because that was like the first time that, you know, as far as I know, anyone tied that word specifically to the film. Um, when I was writing the film in the original draft of the script, it was actually very much about gentrification. And the idea was that when they formed this collective, that the collective decided that they needed to do something about it. And in that draft, they decided to um, sabotage some construction equipment at some sites that were going up building, um, you know, these new condo type buildings. Um, as I got closer to making the film and kind of really thinking about what I wanted to get at, I decided to focus on like more interior issues and then logistical reasons I couldn't do certain things. Mm -hmm. And so I needed like that outside world to kind of be written into the film. And so I started thinking about like conversations I've had um, or situations I've been in where you, you know, you meet people who move into the community and they're just like, you know, Oh, I really am just scraping by and they're like, you know, have these nice apartments. And for them, it's like, you know, their version of survival, but it's like my goal in life is to have something like that. And, you know, that kind of feeling. And so I kind of tried to uh, find a way to kind of get at that with that scene, uh, the sort of, um, yeah, layers of how different people perceive their own position in relation to gentrification. Because mm -hmm. it's often like really subtle and very a slow kind of increase in realization. Right. Um, and I think um, for Zaire, while your film, The Black Men I Know, isn't quite as overt or clear in thinking about gentrification, um, Uncle Trello says something that really stuck out to me that I thought was interesting for this conversation, where he says, the people want to talk to you, but don't know nothing about where you come from and only want one side of the story. Um, and I think it makes it a really interesting point sort of about transactional sort of media practices and documentary practices and not knowing the sort of places that people come from. So I'm just really curious to hear your thoughts on that particular scene and maybe how it sort of relates to the conversation we're having today. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, um, what, he's, he, what he was basically saying is what a lot of, you know, black folks and, and particularly black folks in the South, as far as the work that I do in, in, in film, uh, feel that a lot of people want these stories because uh, um, the black South has not been documented in such a way where black folks are like, are able to tell their story the way they want to. There's a history of, you know, white folk coming in and telling these stories, especially when it comes to like the blues and our and music and and even like um our, our living conditions, there there's always this lens, and sometimes it lends itself to more so um poverty or, or the bad things that happen. And and Phil is just trying to say like, hey, you know, um let us one let us tell our stories, but even when you know when when outsiders come to us. We're not going to tell you the story in which it's true, you know, mm -hmm. the true and authentic story. We're going to give you what you, we're just going to give you enough because we understand that you're not coming, like it is more so transactional. This is not an authentic um, relationship that you're building. You're building this relationship so you can make your movies so that you can make your money so you can. Um, be in film festivals and you can get more grants and you can get more funding. This is not, you know, equitable for this. Is, this is not equitable for me as well. This is for you. 
And so um, as a filmmaker whose mission is to amplify the Black South, I don't want to gentrify, you know, while I'm also telling stories. So, um, yeah, that's my piece on it. Yeah, I, I think what you said is we're just going to give you enough. It's something that we can definitely come back to you because I think that's a really interesting point um, that also kind of really connects to your film, Cane Fire, Anthony, um, and sort of the aspect of, we kind of talked about this in your in-person Q&A, but film is advertising, especially in regards to tourism, um, especially with Hawaii, like post sugarcane and pineapple plantation. And so I kind of wanted to hear you discuss that again, like a little bit more and provide some of the context for some of the ads and the films that are featured in your film, especially if some people haven't seen Cane Fire yet. Sure, yeah, so um, Hollywood's had a long history in Hawaii, um, over 100 years of starting off um, more so kind of a collaboration with the sugar companies as uh, almost PR for their labor practices. Um, once they were, people were finding out in the rest of the world um, what was happening, um, you know, just terrible labor conditions, pay, um, you know, no representation. And so they created this, uh, the, the, whole, um, the whole South Sea fantasy that, that you may be familiar with is something that they kind of created so that they could you know, say that you know, things weren't so bad on the plantation and they invited people to come and, and write about uh, their experiences you know, in this exotic place. Um, and then that was what happened, once they created that and started bringing people over, um, it actually was an, a, a trade or an exchange where when the U.S. came in and said, well, they want to make Hawaii a state to um, control the Pacific in the military. And so it was kind of a passing of the torch of um, creating this new thing of, of, of selling people on the idea of Hawaii as a U.S. state, that this is something that could you know, everyone could be a part of, and and you know, it was pro-military, and and the actual films were actually controlled by the U.S. government, and um, so that was when tour, and then they promoted tourism as well, so people could come, and and uh, it, it could just be absorbed, um, and that was really uh, prevalent, and was uh, for a long time, but then the kind of the next phase was, okay, these films are a little more, uh, not as overt um, in their strategy, but their, the um, styles that they've created and or I guess myths that they have created are so prevalent that people, tourists, um, people that are, might be living you know, as vacation rentals, when they create their own media today through YouTube videos and self-shot stuff, they're recreating these same myths and they don't really know where it's coming from, but it was something that was, you know, forcefully uh, created by, by Hollywood films. Yeah, I think you all are, all are kind of pinpointing on sort of like the, the myths of places and how that plays also into sort of the ideas of what a community should look like. Mm -hmm. um, the I actually, a Q&A that I had recently with Elegance Bratton, who was the director of a film called Peer Kids, which also sort of looks at gentrification, but more so um, at the Christopher Street Pier in New York um, and with LGBTQ youth of color. Um, he said something that I think we should really have some space to discuss. He said gentrification is about maintaining property value. Police are employed to protect people um, not to protect people, but to protect buildings and to protect property. Um, and I think this is present in all of your works, in particular in the inheritance with the elements about the move bombing and sort of the displacement of move members kind of frequently by police. And in the same fashion in your film, Anthony, with um, the activists and the Native Hawaiian activists being displaced more than once um, at the Coco Palms Hotel. And so I was just really interested in hearing all of your thoughts on this particular quote from Elegance and, signed it, and sort of how do you consider that within your own works? Um, I could go first. Um, so when I, when I was looking as 
looking at the def definition or the you know, Webster definition of gentrification, and there's the more real estate aspect, but then there's also uh, more like how you filter and make something more digestible or respectable to a certain group when you describe something. And that, that was interesting to me because um, from my family, you know, my great grandfather immigrated to the Philippines um, and he, to a sugar and pineapple uh, business, um, was involved in the labor movement and he was really, um, you know, he worked within this system when, and through um, through the company to to actually, you know, benefit his life materially. And it got to the point where after World War II, there was actual like some upward mobility with sugar plantation workers. They were getting representation. They were able to uh, live comfortably and, you know, have this middle class existence. And that was interesting to me and I was, I it made, you know, that, that, that was powerful to me. But then I think looking at, uh, the native, uh, Hawaiian activists, it's a different relationship and it's, um, a different relationship to the land They they want the same, you know, comforts and, and but they might not talk about it in the same courts. It's a different relationship to the land where, you know, this group wants to actually, like be self-sufficient on this land. It's not about uh, being uh, absorbed into the middle class. It's more about, and so there's a different way and respecting that difference, but seeing the similarities of, of, of this, of, of two groups that are being, um, you know, suppressed by, by uh, colonialism, but in, they have figured out different ways to, and have different relationships on how to talk about it. And that was something that was uh, a challenge with with approaching the uh, Hawaiian activists. Um, some, if I sh when I was filming with them, they would sh I would show it to some filmmakers that might have been a little more, uh, I guess, some filmmakers are a little more kind of centrist, liberal, and they were saying, well, they need to they need to make a concrete argument, or they need to present what they want in this way to be an acceptable thing that's absorbed rather than listening to them on their own terms and their own ideology of how they want to talk about something and how it's a different relationship to something else. Um, that was, that was something that we, I had to be very conscious of. Um, I guess I, I'll add, you know, this idea of, um, private property, you know, um, and this protection of private property and how that relates to, Gentrification, you know, I mean, I, I think so much of the conversation around gentrification at the moment, it's very sort of like, you know, um, I'll say binary where you have like the gentrifiers, right? And then you have the people who are in the community, right? Um, in actuality, uh, there's a lot of gray area, I think, and there are a lot of ways that people who are um, potential gentrifiers can do things to work against it. And then there are hopefully to a certain degree things that can happen within certain communities. Uh, primarily I'm thinking of, you know, black communities uh, mm -hmm. that um, we can do to, to facilitate a, a better situation. And for me, as always this idea of private property, it's really hard to think about it in terms of like the cutting edge of gentrification right now, because really it has to do with the historic disenfranchisement of black people for centuries, you know, and the inability to own land, um, and even after the migration north, the inability to buy houses, etc. And we're all suffering from that now. So like, you know, this idea of private property, theoretically, some of what's happening could be a good thing if we in our own communities own the property and everybody's property value is going up, and we're therefore getting better schools, etc. Right? That would be good, but that's not what's happening because we don't own, we rent in our own so-called communities, right? Um, and so for me, that that's the heart of the matter. So when I was making my film, you know, interestingly enough, when I sat down to write the script, I had to change a lot just to make it more relevant in terms of what we're talking about, um, or not relevant, but clear. The house that um, I was living in at the time was not inherited. It was given to us actually uh, by a group of uh, sort of, I'll say, anti-gentrification activists. Um, and the backstory 
to make it brief is that uh, way back in, I want to say the mid to late 60s, uh, this sort of um, hippie Christian radical group had formed in Philly and bought a bunch of um, houses in West Philly, uh, which were kind of very cheap and run down at the time with the goal of facilitating all sorts of conferences and meetings. Um, as time went on, they realized that they were creating gentrification um, and the property value started to go up. So what they did was um, made a, a contract basically saying, we're gonna give these houses to uh, communities of activists, uh, you know, people who, uh, you know, there was one house for people who had formerly been homeless, et cetera, but that in order to live in these houses, you had to have a mission that would enhance that community, so forth. So the house that I lived in was like a house given on our proposal to be a house for uh, black activists to be able to do our work and not have to work full time. And so there I feel like was an example of people having the foresight to say, we're creating a negative impact in a lot of ways. What can we do with that resource? And then the same, and then for me in the film, it was more like, you know, I don't own a house right now. I, I rent, I've always rented, but it's kind of like, rather than thinking about fighting in particular ways, it's like, okay, what resources we do have, what can we do with them to kind of, again, further our own causes? So it's like maybe someone inherits something, okay, what do you do with that? Like, do you make it a collective space? Do you sell it, you know, to the people who are then going to gentrify so forth? So that was kind of uh, where it relates for me. But yeah, ultimately, yeah, it's about, it's about private property. And my bigger question is like, where's our money to have our own private property? Because that's the only way we're going to, I think, bet any of this. Sayer, did you have any thoughts? Um, since mine doesn't necessarily directly uh, tie into it, but I will just say, you know, um, I do feel like gentrification um, in the sense of my family, or just the people who uh, will trail in a way who are, who are in the film, um, is, is I, I think it definitely takes on both. It takes on both the real estate and things of that sort, meaning in, in our in in this case, like it's it going down, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not able to uh, afford, you know, to to live in a, in a sense in in these neighborhoods. And now this this place is beginning to be run down and run down and run down. And now we have people with money seeing potential and seeing how close it is maybe to downtown or midtown or mm -hmm. these kind of thriving areas that were once run down. And now um, we have this sense of, okay, now as as a person who lives in, the, in, in, in an area that is considered the hood or less than, now across the street from me, I see these big, beautiful homes. I see these people who live in these um, beautiful, seeming like beautiful and perfect lives now I have to see that every day and like put the measure there against how I'm living and how you're living and how if I just cross the train tracks wow what a difference so now you know that that puts a, another level or another like uh I guess another wall up against as to how am I going to quote unquote pull myself up by my bootstraps in order to, you know, live the life that I, you know, I desire. So I, I feel like gentrification in, in, in this way, um, really affects the psyche. Not, not just like, oh, I can't keep stay in my home, but what that, what that also represents as to like, what I have access to and how close I can see, like, oh, I really don't. I don't ever feel like I can get to that way. I mean, I can't ever achieve this amount of like success or wealth from where I am now. Like how? So it, it I feel like it, it does something psychologically, you know, and I guess also emotionally, spiritually to to folk. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And. We're gonna kind of come back to that. I'm gonna ask one more question and then Zaire, I actually have like a specific question for you to kind of explore that a little bit more. Um, another element that I kind of wanted us to talk about today is sort of 
the reclaiming and redefining of a space um, or creating a community. And that kind of happens in different ways in the inheritance and in cane fire. Um, and I know Ephraim, you were writing the inheritance partially from your own experience, sort of in a collective um, in that similar way. And then Anthony, you were kind of looking at it from as sort of like a documenter of these activists who were forming their own community and creating and reclaiming the cocoa palms for their own. And so I sort of wanted to hear from both of you about sort of the differences in terms of experiencing um, forming a community and reclaiming a space and sort of Anthony for you, what was it like sort of witnessing um, those activists create a community for themselves before it was of course uh, taken away by the US Marshals? Yeah, um, that, so um, my research really started with um, my, my family who you know, are immigrant settlers and their relationship to how they were able to survive on the island and now how it's now at a point where they're not able to stay any longer. Cousins my age are, are being priced out and it's obviously more dramatic because it's not being pushed further in the neighborhood, it's being pushed off the island completely, um, especially when family is such a strong part uh, of their lives. Um, for the native Hawaiian activists, um, so I had heard about the Coco Palms Hotel and how it was this this focus point of, of golden era Hollywood with Elvis and all that. And I knew about the history before that the kings and queens of Hawaii lived here, there's burials, there's temples here. Um, but it was something that you know was kind of a dormant history until these activists um, showed up and and you know, they're not occupying, they're more, um, they're uh, maintaining, they're reclaiming the land. They, they came onto the property, began growing taro, which is um, a root crop um, that native wines grew, that um, they set up, uh, you know, their own housing and they were um, living self-sufficiently and uh, they were demonstrating it, in other words. And, um, I think the exchange with them it was it was uh, that was different from the rest of the film was um, you know they were their time was very valuable they wanted to uh, any sort of media it was it was for their cause and so my agreement with them which I don't know um, that felt right at the time was that any time I spent filming with them for you know, my film that I wanted to connect to other things uh, while being curious of connecting these histories that anything I filmed that they would have access to for their own purposes, you know, the things that are interesting to me might not be interesting to them and, you know, things, points that they want to get across, um, you know, for their, for their own cause. And so, um, unfortunately, because the, uh, the, the camp fell apart and they were kicked off by the U.S. Marshals. Um, I, they weren't able to follow up with, with um, their goal. So I don't know if that was something that would have helped them or if it would have been successful, but that was the idea initially was that I didn't want them to waste time thinking with me thinking that um, this would be just an advocacy piece for them, I, but I wanted them to make, create that on their own if they wanted to and, and talk about things the way, the way they wanted to. Um, so that was kind of what it was like witnessing it. I mean, so much history um, that I cover in the film that has passed, it was, uh, it was exciting to see a group use that history and actually before your eyes, like really um, take direct action. Um, for, for, for me, that, that when I think back about that, phase as it relates to kind of what you're saying in terms of reclamation um, and the things that I'm like most grateful for about it and even like what did the house consist of um, in terms of the members and I, I think for me when I think about it now all of the people we were all black we we're all living together we we're all young people uh, but I would say in some ways we were all people within our own communities felt like not like um 
whole in any given situation. Like I had like a roommate from uh, Tanzania who grew up in a very sort of orthodox uh, Muslim context, you know, um, and in, in the house, it was a space for her to kind of not be um, as kind of governed by that, but to still at the same time explore herself as a, a, a woman from uh, Tanzania living in Philly, et cetera, and so forth and so on for everyone else, people who, you know, so we're all kind of negotiating our own sense of black identity within that space, um, but that it didn't have to be the same. We weren't trying to reach one like, okay, now we are, you know, call us this and we believe in these seven or eight, nine, ten, whatever things, but that um, we were all there kind of exploring who we were and it's just a reclamation of that, of just being black, um, and that that blackness being defined as an exploration, like a very open question, um, but amongst ourselves, you know. Um, and I think a lot of us have had situations exploring that where we're from or in college and places where you're always having to negotiate that sense of who you are with an outsider's judging eye or questioning eye and therefore kind of slowing down some of the progress. And so I think for us, it was like, we can get together, we can disagree, we can, you know, pull different things. And so that was kind of one of the things in the film, like kind of like, you can get an idea from here, you can get an idea from there um, and, you know, work all of these things out. And I think as that sort of um, developed, the sort of organic sort of like cohesion came mm -hmm. out of that, you know, that I think happened. And so I think for us, it was rather than like kind of, we were very close with MOVE, um, and we're learning a lot like directly from MOVE, but at the same time, um, it was like rather than just copy what they were doing or look at movements of the past, it's like kind of saying, okay, well, you know, we're getting this from here and that from there. And how can we, rather than just talk about these things or debate them, like how can we put these ideas into practice with each other and try to, you know, build something um, sustaining? And so for me, it was kind of like, uh, reclaiming the legacy of those kind of um, exploratory spaces that, you know, I read about or admire so much from, from other eras, you know. Um, and so I would also add to that, that's something that, you know, no one who lived in that house at the time lives there anymore. However, the house as uh, the institution that was meant to be still exists. Um, but everyone from there has gone on, I would say everyone's involved in pretty serious um, activists for um, or scholarship at this level. And so I think it was more of a, a spiritual thing um, ultimately that, that kind of came out of it um, and that, you know, empowered everyone that was kind of in contact um, with that space. Yeah, yeah. What, what you're saying about that experience kind of reminds me of what we try to do with the Black Creators Forum here at Indie Memphis in creating a space for people to to connect and really explore, like having that exploratory space is something that we don't always have time to really do with each other. So that's that's really beautiful to hear that you kind of had that experience. Um, so I'll ask probably two more questions and then we'll open it up to some audience questions. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to drop them in any of the Eventive or YouTube or Facebook chats and they'll be forwarded to me. Um, so this conversation having was kind of inspired by a film called Residue, which is on Netflix and directed by Marawi Jarima. And it's about a filmmaker who returns home with the intention of like writing a screenplay about his home. And he kind of comes to grips with the fact that one, his home has changed. It's set in DC, so it's in part due to the changing because of gentrification, but also because he didn't keep um, connected with his home after he left. He didn't really keep in touch with the men he grew up with um, or really in touch with the community that he grew up in. And so the film's kind of about those tensions. And there's a line early on in the beginning um, where he's kind of asking himself, did you sense that our obliteration was around the corner and you used the only weapon you had, a camera? Um, and so that kind of brought up a question for me that I wanted to ask Zaire, but feel free, the rest of you can also feel free to answer this. But um, as someone who, like, I moved away from Memphis, then I've come back to Memphis now, and you also moved away from Memphis, and you're coming back and sort of working to uplift the Black American South specifically. Um, and I just wanted to hear from you about how do you sort of approach your own work and thinking about yourself as someone who wasn't living here for a period of time, but has returned 
to the space and sort of balancing that kind of tension within yourself. We've already have kind of talked about this, but I'd love to hear you talk about it some more, Zaire. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm a native of Memphis, Tennessee. And um, right after, uh, I guess I graduated high school, I was off. I'm gone. I'm never coming back. Um, but like, um, as you know, the vibe is, as it is, like I'm back here telling you know stories about the Black South. But if you if you if you talk to any Memphian, no matter where we are in the world, we're from Memphis and we're proud. Especially when we are out of the city, I'm from Memphis. You know, it is it, this very much so pride that we have in Memphis. So coming back. It was um, and, and and doing the work that I'm doing now. It was is I look at it more as a um, a learning experience, not as like I've been out of touch because I've always come back, you know, to Memphis for holidays for you know visiting family. Like I've never been necessarily out of touch with the place, but it's different when you actually live and you you're you're riding through streets every day. You. You, you're going to the stores, you're, you're meeting new people, there's a difference. And so I, I approach it as like honoring the 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 um, every day. Mm -hmm. You know, like Zora Neale Hurston talked about it, you know, really capturing the, the everyday, um, the everyday black folks that, that, that whose stories don't really get told or told in the fashion in which they would say they need to be, right? To be uh, a mirror up to to their lives and, and, and what they experience. So I think um, moving back to Memphis has allowed me to appreciate the stories and appreciate the history. You know, when you, you're living in a place, um, you don't really see the gems with, with fresh eyes. But when you come back and you're on a mission and you have a purpose, you begin to, to see the gems that that need to be like cherished and and I see that in my city. And so with that uh new lens, I'm like, okay, we're about to we're about to get a lot of these stories told and we're gonna do it in a, a way that does not gentrify them as to like refine them for other people's, you know, palettes, but to do it in an authentic, beautiful way in which those people in Memphis, these folks in Memphis, and specifically, like I said, what I do, these black folks in Memphis get to tell their stories in the most Memphis, the most black, most Southern type of way. You know, they possibly can because it's on the record and it's archived and they were here. So um, that's, that's, that's how I'm, you know, really approaching it. Yeah, that's, that is wonderful and amazing. And, um, this last question that I'm gonna ask you all before we open it up to an audience question is a big one. I, I will say it is a big one. So if you can't fully answer it, it's okay. But I wanted to hear you all's thoughts on it. Um, just thinking about sort of the communal sort of resistance and building of community that's present in all of your films. Um, I'm really curious about what a filmmaking practice could look like. What What would filmmaking look like if that was sort of the approach to operating. Um, I'm kind of thinking about like, you know how we have some cities that are these filmmaking hubs mm -hmm. and what gentrification has occurred in those places because like New York and LA, these big places. And then we have these cities that are becoming more and more of these filmmaking hubs. And so I, that kind of brought up the question for me of what does gentrification look like within filmmaking and places becoming these really popular um, options so i guess the question for me is like what 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 do you all think of filmmaking practice that's like actively anti gentrification anti um a remaking of the space in a way that's not thoughtful what would that look like to you all yeah that that's that's a great i mean that's the question right i mean um this is a really important issue in in, in every way um like you're talking about this idea right of like the gentrification of a, a practice or a practice that's just inherently going to do that uh, in terms of filmmaking. And this is something I, I think a lot about um, as a maker, especially as a maker uh, with a, what people would call it an experimental film background. Mm -hmm. uh, although a lot of people in uh, experimental film would call what they do independent film relative to something else that's often called independent film. Um, 
But as someone independent in terms of you're paying out of pocket and you're doing all of the shooting, editing, mm -hmm. you know, it's fiercely independent. Um, I think there's a lot of beautiful work that comes out of that. And when I look at the legacy of black cinema, um, internationally speaking, not just African American cinema, but from the diaspora, uh, in, in my opinion, the greatest works have always come from people um, operating at the margins financially or, 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 or otherwise. And there's a beauty there um, in those works. But I think sometimes we have this tendency to look at those works and go, well, what if they had a billion dollars to make X, Y, and Z? What if, mm -hmm. you know, um, Ivan Dixon had a giant budget to make a spook who sat by the door. Well, he would have made something other than what he made, and what he made is super fantastic. And so my my sort of antidote, if there is one to this sort of issue, I think has a lot to do with perception in terms of viewership. Um, I really think that, you know, there are a million ways for films to be beautiful, uh, but I think sometimes we get caught up in a slick, polished sort of representation of a place. Like Leia was saying, people want to come to Memphis, they want to represent, you know, Beale Street a certain kind of way, and it has to look a certain kind of way, and it, I think, takes away from a certain rawness. And then you have the mainstream who, like, they don't want to see an unrefined film, they only want to see these polished works. Well, what people don't realize is for that work to look that way, you got to bring in all these people. They're often in unions that are racist or have all these issues. And so it's hard to go into a community and just like employ everybody locally to make these massive movies. Right. But when you start to break down that scale, that's exactly what can happen. And so, like, just use my own film as an example. It was like a very low budget film. It's like, OK, I'm making this film about Philly. It's about home. Unfortunately, I couldn't shoot it in Philly. I had to shoot it on this set. But one thing I guaranteed was the people who I'm going to be distributing money to in terms of resources, these are going to be people um, that need the money that have put in work that um, have some relationship to that community that's always in enhanced it. And I think the more that we're able to kind of work within our own independence in that way, the better it will be. So it's like, I'm able to say, okay, well, let's make sure that Sonia gets, you know, something there. Mm -hmm. I definitely got to look after move. Um, definitely got to look after Mike's parents. They just got out. Like, how can I directly employ those people? And we're not talking massive sums of money, you know, but in the context that we're talking about, you know, rent's getting paid, groceries are getting bought, you're helping people to get by. And I think, you know, um, there, I feel like there's an in-between space in terms of practice that, you know, where that can happen and we can have more control. Um, now the problem is, and what everyone, I'm always on these panels and they say, well, yeah, but who's going to watch the work? And my opinion is, was that my problem or is that the problem of people who only watch Hollywood movies? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I think that's great. I, I, I think Efren nailed it where I think um, it's all about um, the filmmaker having their own resources. And I don't think it takes that much more, but it's just enough that it's immediately prohibitive to most people. And um, I think this uh, this dynamic of of you know writing grants and having to immediately translate what your your vision into something that's more palatable. It's like um, you know, it's it, that's that's like a form of gentrification in itself, where you have to translate your vision and then you know maybe you can finally do it the way you want to, but you still have to talk about it in a certain way to appeal to other people. To just get away from that and just have your own resources and be accountable to your collaborators and your and your audience and the people you're representing and not worrying about anything else would just be great. <laughs> I think um, just through this conversation, I'm, I'm now looking at gentrification differently too, as far as like how it has affected um, the, like I guess the mindset of of me as a creator, as a maker, as a filmmaker, and like how I define, like how I define, um, I guess my art and, and and my work and the stories that I'm telling, and like, am I really, am I looking at, am I looking at the work via like this? this Hollywood lens of, hey, it needs to be spectacular, it needs to be this, it needs to be that, 
And is that truly my aim or is it, or am I truly being true to what I'm saying as in, I need this to be anti-gentrification at all. It does not need to be, you know, this refined piece that is palatable to, you know, the masses, but I'm just trying to put authentic stories on record of folks that look like me, that sound like me, um, but have totally different and complex and beautiful and, 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 and diverse stories. Like now it's holding the mirror up to me and said like, how has gentrification really shaped and molded, you know, your goals and, and your um, lens towards what you're doing. And so I think um, that has had an impact. And that's something that I feel like I'll be way more intentional on doing, even when I critique my own work and in, in the work of others, like, how 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 am I letting this like seep in? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we only have one audience question that's kind of related to this, but more specific about um, space. But, so I'll go ahead and ask it. It's from Avento. It says, "What is the responsibility of artists, including filmmakers, who often represent the first wave of gentrification slash development?" when new arts districts come into neighborhoods due to cheap rent and available real estate for studios, galleries, and theater spaces. So kind of thinking about the use of space, um, sort of similar to what we were just talking about. Um, I, I, I would say um, for, for myself, in terms of my, my, my thinking around these, these issues, um, Again, we we're talking about this idea of artists, uh, it's a very wide, wide thing, but I, I would say, you know, it depends on what the artist looks like, you know, are they, a, you know, artists can mean a lot of things. And so, I mean, we're talking about professional artists, you know, that that's one thing, uh, but they're, you know, poor communities already have artists in them, you know, so it's, yeah. not, it's not that, you know, artists are this like, thing that come in and gentrify, a lot of, a lot of art gets displaced by, by gentrification, mm -hmm. right? And so, in a wide sense, let's say graffiti in New York City, right? That's a beautiful art form displaced by gentrification. And so art's already there. The question is, what are we doing with the art in the community and what does that art intend to do? The people who gentrify and this idea of cheap rent and all that, yeah, these are generally people are saying, it's a capitalist venture, you know, mm -hmm. which is like, I would even argue, are they even artists? You know, um, but, you know, I think there are ways to safeguard about these sort of things that are just tactical things like what, you know, you know, like this term black aesthetics, right, gets thrown around, right? And uh, but very few people actually read the essay called Black Aesthetics. And when you look at this as a definition of what may or may not fit the category, right? And the actual like criteria for such. And the way work relates to the community and its relevance to the community, its functionality within the community is one of these criteria. And so I think that, you know, if people are approaching the art and the arts from the right place, that it actually will help a community. Uh, but often it's the latter that happens. People want to, you know, make a painting that can go in a dentist's office or down at the new cafe that opens up, and that's the end-all, be-all, right? Um, but depending on what that is, how it's back into the community, that could be a good thing, right? The gentrifying party opens a cafe and wants paintings. Usually they don't go around in the community and say, who's already here making art? They go and get their homies from college or whatever. And that's what they put up there. And so I think, again, there's some overlap where art can help and not not, not harm um, gentrification in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, it's, but, you know, to the point of the question, that is a part of the current business model of gentrification. You get the artists in, but trust me, they're not talking about all artists. They're talking about certain artists, you know, and uh, certain artists that are there with an agenda to just make money off of art and that's that. But, um, yeah, for me, that's just focused from the outset. So it's like, yeah, I don't know. You know, they're like people who deal in the arts, but you know, it, it's it's different. I think for the sort of professional class of artists um, that are definitely uh, there to gentrify. It couldn't be anything else. Yeah, I think when coming into a space, um, especially when you're trying to, I guess in your mind uplifted or whatever whatever the goal is, there definitely needs to be a community, you know, um, meeting of, of folks who are already there to see how they can benefit from you coming into their communities. Because in, in, in our reality, at least for a period of time, 
these folks are going to be the folks who like help you, whether you're whether it's a business or anything, like there these folks will be interacting with you in some sort. Especially, like I said, especially if it's a business, these folks are coming in and, and patronizing and things of that sort. If they if there is an employment need, why not employ them? You know, if if you're you know redoing homes, why not, you know, ask folks, hey, you know, what's what skills do you have? Can you come and help me? We have money to, you know, you know, provide for you or to to fund these these ventures or whatever. So I really feel like um, gentrification in general needs to be there, but especially in filmmaking, like us as filmmakers, like it is our responsibility when we come into people's communities is to really build relationships with them and relationships in which, like, of course, the main goal is to get the film done. Like and, and to like tell their story, but how can we really? Um, how can we not be gentrified in a way that we come in, get the story, promote it, and be gone? Like, how can we continue to have a connection with that community? Whether it's hey, you know, these films are playing here, here, here. I'm gonna send you the link to it. Um, post on social, or I'm getting, a, or I want a prize here. Now it's not that much, but I'm a, I'm gonna shoot you a, a little cash here, a little cash there. So figuring out a way in just our practices on how we can be, you know, anti gentrification in the sense of like popping in, and we, we, we basically hit it and quit it, and on to the next, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anthony, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think um, maybe to just, since my film has so much archive in it, um, maybe contributing in that way that, you know, I think what, what I want to do from the outset, in, in addition to um, filming with, with communities in Kauai, was to recontextualize Hollywood films and critique them. Um, and I think right off the bat, there was a discouragement because, uh, you know, what if you did this, how are you going to get the rights or, you know, what's the end product that you're going to sell off of this? So you should, you know, I was discouraged to take this route, but it's like, it's, you know, something that has a material effect on people's lives and it's, it's, it's uh, worth having the conversation and worth dissecting and, and it, and it shouldn't uh, dissuade anybody from this is from repurposing culture that is, uh, that is working against them. And I think, um, I guess thinking in that mindset of like, what's actually uh, um, contributing to a conversation versus what's something that can be packaged and may or may not be uh, applicable, applicable to someone's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you all are also hitting on like, once something is established, like getting out of the way, that's another element of this as well. Um, that, People uplift things, but they're they're not willing to to let take let the power be taken away from them after a certain amount of time. Um, we have one more question from the audience. Um, this is from YouTube. They said you touched on this, but can BIPOC people, especially artists, be gentrifiers? Um, <laughs> tricky question. I don't feel like I'm in a position to really answer, but I'll answer with the question. Why not? Yeah, I mean, depending on the definition, yeah. I mean, if if we're solely going on definition, yeah, I mean, historically, no. Um, and and correct me if I'm wrong, is this this B I P O C? Yes. Okay. Um, well, indigenous and people of color. Yeah. So um, I I I've never said say it audibly, so I don't necessarily yeah. know. The, um, <laughs> you know, pronounce it. But I, I do like like I said, historically I don't feel like we are. Um but in in a sense of um I guess if, if we take the definition of refining things of that sort, um to make it palatable to others, 
that could definitely like that that's a lens but we also we also deal with you know what we the boy says in the souls of black folks is this double consciousness you know you, you you're walking around you know having two two lives you know one as a black person one as american trying to you know balance so which one I, am i going to present so there's a lens that we like intrinsically have like a lens through our eyes and a lens through you know greater society and we then like i said with with this conversation i've kind of taken um i'm i have to take a look at myself and see okay is this lens something that i really need to consider and i guess that's the um also a question to folks of you know of color like yes in that sense we can be gentrified but it, is that something that we need you know or yeah is there something we need and i i think no you know yeah i would i would also add to that that for me it also becomes a question of which is a deep frustration of mine and i say i can only speak for myself so you know what i mean what it means for me to ask this question as african-american as a black person is a very different thing than say an indigenous person you know that's why i'm like well you know first of all we're talking about a big catch-all but what I will say is that, you know, does anyone have the right to practice like unfettered raw capitalism that exploits other people? And I would just say definitely not, you know what I mean? So it's like, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I mean, there's the pedestrian level of like, you dress a certain way and that kind of, you know, little things that we think of as related to gentrification, but that's not really the heart of the matter. So I don't really care what like person multi-millionaire billionaire buys up a block you know what i mean i i don't really care what they look like you know so it's like um so for me yeah and it's like you know that it just is what it is and i think there's a lot of unchecked just rampant exploitation that for some reason because certain people look a certain way we're okay with it but that it's it's tearing up you know uh, a lot of communities and uh, and you know, we're not even talking about the continent, you know, what goes on there. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, a deep, deep, deep question, but, um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, I guess from, from my point of view, um, I think it, it is unfortunate in Hawaii that um, the immigrant uh, settler population, there has been um, an unequalness between the indigenous population that there can be, um, uh, in an economic sense, uh, there can be there's there can be gentrification, I think, and um, but because there, if you're engaging in a just a particular way of you know this material ownership or fo following the statehood rules of ownership of land, engaging that way against you know Native Hawaiians who are, might be following uh, the you know kingdom law before it was a state. I think that's where the clash can, can, can come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think this this has been such an interesting and thoughtful and rich conversation, and this is a probably good place for us to stop. Um, I just want to say thank you to each of you. Thank you, Zaire. Thank you, Ephraim. Thank you, Anthony, for your time and your thoughts. Um, this was a great indie talk to sort of end the festival on. Um, so thank you again for being here today, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I want to also thank everybody watching and remind you that we have a live Q&A with the director of I Blame Society later on tonight, Jillian Horvat speaking with Sia Anger. Um, and this is our last indie talk for the festival, so I hope that these were an enriching experience for all of you. Thank you all for watching and enjoy these last few days of the festival. And thanks again to the panelists for being here. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.